Welcome to the second annual Asian Pacific American Heritage Month celebration here at Bristol Community College. My name is Rax Van Penn. I'm the co-chair of the Affirmative Action Committee. And Marlene, my other co-chair. Hi. <laughs> Marlene Pollitt. Um, I don't need to introduce our president of BCC, uh, John Spraker. What a wonderful occasion this is. We're so excited about our guest speaker. We had Dr. Sin from the uh, Science Department uh, at UMass Dartmouth a couple days ago, and he spoke about India and uh, the culture, uh, and we had a good crowd for that. And, uh, that was the premier event, I think, for uh, Asian Pacific history uh, of the month. And now we have uh, uh, just a, a wonderful, wonderful person. I can't believe that we were able to talk her into coming uh, because of last week. She should be having a nervous breakdown <laughs> after all the things that she did for her inauguration. It was a rolling festival day after day. Something was going on and she had to be at the mall. And uh, It's wonderful that she agreed to come to help us launch this important uh, occasion for Bristol Community College. And we want to celebrate our diversity. Uh, uh, we embrace it. It uh, strengthens everything that we do at the college. Our courses are stronger. Our programs are stronger. Student life is stronger because of our diversity and the great strengths that people bring to us. Uh, you know, I always complain uh, at African American History Month that it's only a month. It shouldn't be a month. It should be the 365 days as well as women's history, Hispanic history, and I'm so glad that we're honoring uh, Asian Pacific history as well, uh, and the cultures that go with it, because they make us all stronger. A couple days ago, we had the International Festival, our international club, 50, 50, uh, 50 countries plus Puerto Rico, and people came in their native dress, and the food, and the music, uh, and it just uh, is a vivid demonstration to the importance of diversity for our for our institution, our great institution. And now to make our great institution even greater, it's my honor to introduce to you uh, our speaker. Uh, she has a wonderful story to tell. Uh, it's inspiring, uh, the things that she had to overcome and the way that uh, chance took, took, uh, took her to certain areas uh, of her life and pathways. And now, uh, as I mentioned, we celebrated her um, her uh, inauguration last week as the chancellor of UMass Dartmouth, a terrific regional institution, one of the one of the premier regional universities, research universities in the country, in the country. And we have it right here, 13 miles away in our backyard. So we're very lucky, uh, very fortunate uh, to uh, have her come. She brought some of that Florida weather with her yeah. uh, today, <laughs> finally. I was a little worried about her during some of those snowballs. But uh, I think we're going to, you really, gonna, I don't think, I know you're going to really enjoy this uh, presentation and this story uh, and draw inspiration from it. So it's my honor to introduce to you Davina Grossman, Chancellor of UMass. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. Can you hear me? No, I have to use this? Okay. okay. So do I need this? Yes. I do. Okay. Well, I don't have a... Um, I don't have a pocket to anchor this to, but I'll manage. Um, good afternoon to all of you. Uh, sort of a little bit more gusto there. Good afternoon. Okay, now we've got the Bristol Community College spirit, right? So I want to thank President Jack Sprague. By the way, he's a beloved president, isn't he? Not just here, but in the region. And of course, your beloved Vice President, where is she, Joan Menard? She's back there. <laughs> Who's beloved not just at BCC, but in the entire Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And of course, the Chairman of your board. Uh, he's back there, Fernando Garcia. Thank you so much. And I can't help but acknowledge that our prominent alumnus back there, Don Wood, is sitting back there. Thank you so much for being here. He's on your faculty and I'm sure making great contributions every day. And I want to thank Rax May Penn, the co-chairs, and Marlene Pollock for uh, hosting this this afternoon. And I want to thank the dean. Where, where is she? Sarah Morrill. Oh, back here. Good to meet you and thank you for being here this afternoon. And thank you to all of you. So I was briefly going around the room finding out 
where you're from. So I gather some of you are immigrants from your respective countries, as I am an immigrant from the Philippines, but some of you are first, second, or third generation immigrants probably, but what I heard represented are countries such as Vietnam, Cambodia, Bangladesh, there's somebody there from Hong Kong, China, Thailand, um, was there any country I didn't mention? Pakistan. Pakistan. Any other country? Haiti. From Haiti, okay, wonderful. Not part of Asia, but <laughs> in the Caribbean basin. Yes, yes. And, and, and there is a fairly uh, significant Haitian population in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, correct? Uh, and I'm sure that uh, the students at BCC, just like the students at UMass Dartmouth, we have students that go to Haiti every year on a mission, a uh, health mission, so I'm sure you do the same. They go to Blanchard uh, with their faculty members to do community health nursing. So uh, I'm thrilled to be here uh, to join your celebration of Asian Pacific Heritage Month. I am an immigrant from a small town in the Philippines, uh, and that's 7,000 miles from here, uh, and I immigrated in 1979. So that tells you more or less how long I've spent there and how long I've spent here because I came here at the age of 24. So you can calculate my age. <laughs> so um, Asian Pacific Americans, so I'm just going to make this just a very quick overview and then I'm eager to hear your questions. So I have intentionally not included too much content because I want to hear the questions from you so that this can be a robust discussion. So Asian Pacific Americans constitute about 5% of the population of the United States representing those who immigrated to the US or whose ancestors, as many of you, uh, you were born in the US uh, but your ancestors may have come from Asia. So whose ancestors immigrated from countries such as China, India, Korea, Japan, Vietnam, Cambodia, and many others. We are an incredibly heterogeneous group with varying histories of immigration to this country. I taught for many years a course that I developed called Culture and Advanced Nursing Practice because I have a bachelor's, master's, and PhD in nursing. Um, and this course is required of all nursing students at Florida International University. And in that course, one of the things that we did is to review the histories of immigrant groups to the United States. It's very important to understand culture, to understand the history. Uh, the history of that immigrant group, the circumstances around their departure from their home country to the United States, and to the history of that immigrant group. I want to congratulate all of you who are pursuing higher education here at BCC. You and I are very, very fortunate to be in this country because where we are right now in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts is one state that's leading the country in terms of college completion. When you look at the United States, the college completion rate is 39%, but in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, it is 54%. That's very impressive, right? The highest college completion rate in the United States is in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. However, there is a subset there that we should be concerned about, that we should be working toward increasing college completion, and that is in our communities, in New Bedford and in Fall River. In Fall River, it was 13% last year. It had increased this year to 14%. In New Bedford, it's 10%. So that tells us part of the story is in the numbers, but then when you look deeper, you see the context of the story. And in understanding the history and understanding the culture, we understand why those numbers are very different from the numbers in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And I think the juxtaposition of those numbers, when you look at 54% versus 10%, or 54% versus 14%, we should be very concerned that we should also understand why those numbers got to be that way. So from the earliest days of this Commonwealth, education has been revered as the great economic and social equalizer. Written into the Massachusetts Constitution are memorable words from John Adams and I was very touched when I first uh, stepped into the State House when I started in my new role uh, to see 
uh, different sculptures there, busts of John Adams and his words. Um, and he said, wisdom and knowledge as well as virtue diffuse generally among the body of the people being necessary for the preservation of their rights and liberties. And as these depend on spreading the opportunities and advantages of education in the various parts of the country and among different orders of the people, it shall be the duty of legislatures and magistrates, I just love that, in all future periods of this commonwealth to cherish, I don't think I've seen the word cherish in law the way it's set here, to cherish the interests of literature and the sciences. How many places have that word to cherish the interests of literature and the sciences? Later, in the same passage, our founders expressed that education encouraged the promotion of agriculture, arts, sciences, commerce, trades, manufacturers, and a natural history of the country, and inculcated in the citizenry, I'm quoting directly, the principles of humanity, uh, general benevolence, public and private charity, industry and frugality, honesty and punctuality in their dealings, sincerity, good humor, and all social affections and generous sentiments among the people. How visionary is that? To have that in the Constitution of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. I mean, no wonder we're at that 54%, the top college completion rate in the United States. Now, I'd like to share with you my own personal story. I grew up in a very modest home. Uh, and I had uh, three sisters and two brothers. I grew up in a home with no telephone, no television, no refrigerator, no shower, actually not much of many resources that we take for granted here in the United States. So my mother was a fourth grade teacher and she was also the library property custodian. So what I had a lot of is a lot of love in the family, a lot of caring in the family. We all got together at my grandmother's house every Sunday and we played together a lot and did a lot of things together. But we also had a lot of books. Because my mother was the library property custodian, I had access to every book I wanted. And whenever there was a fresh delivery of books, I got to borrow them ahead of everybody. Uh, and so I read voraciously. I read incessantly and I read exuberantly. I loved reading. So one of those books that I read is a book called Nurses Who Led the Way. And I just happened to see it in a garage sale not that long ago and I bought the whole lot of them. I mean, it's a book from the 60s, but I happened to see it so it's still available. Um, I mean, they're old and decrepit and probably nobody but me is interested in them. But that evoked in me a burning desire to be like the heroic nurses that were described in the book. Every chapter was about a heroic nurse. So I read about Clara Barton, who was the founder of the American Red Cross, and I read about Lillian Wald, who founded the Henry Street Settlement in New York City. I read about Mary Breckenridge, who established the Frontier Nursing Association in Appalachia, and you saw her portrayed in pictures as riding the horse, visiting the Appalachian communities, and I read about Mary Frances Cabrini. So that's where the desire to be a nurse started, and I wanted to be like those nurses. My father was a veteran of the United States Armed Forces in the Far East, uh, called Yusafe. So that was um, during the Japanese occupation of the Philippines in World War II. And it was through the transfer of his GI Bill educational benefits to his children that I and my siblings were able to obtain a college education. It's kind of interesting that the story has turned around full circle because I find myself leading a public university and the reason I was able to obtain a college education was because of the GI Bill uh, from the United States Veterans Affairs because of my father having fought uh, in the United States Armed Forces in the Far East. So when I finished my Bachelor of Science in Nursing at the University of Santo Tomas, it is a 400 year old university. It was founded in 1611. It's a little bit older than Harvard. Um, and I was hired there when I graduated to be an instructor. Uh, and what I found out from my mentor, and my mentor is still alive and I still keep up with her, uh, her name is Dr. Dolly Garcia, what I found out from her was that I would not have any chance at all of 
rising through the academic ladder if I did not obtain graduate degrees. And she was very emphatic that the graduate degrees either had to be from Europe or the United States. And she herself had a PhD from UCLA. So the only way I could do this is if I worked because my parents could never afford to send me to the US to go to graduate school. And so I concocted a plan to apply to work as a staff nurse at Mount Sinai Medical Center in Miami Beach. So I did that and I applied to take the board exams because you could not work as a professional nurse unless you passed the board exams. So I did that and at the same time started looking into the master's program at the University of Miami. So the story proceeded accordingly except for one unexpected part of it which was I met my husband. He was a psychiatrist who was called on consultation on one of my patients. And so I met him and we got married a couple of years later. We had children and the story is I never went back to the Philippines except to visit. And while I was at Mount Sinai, I was involved in clinical nursing research. We had a uh, PhD in nursing research who came to the hospital and started conducting clinical research and I was hooked. That was my ambition, is I wanted to be a nurse researcher. And so I decided that I was going to be serious about this and go and apply to a PhD program. So that path took me to the University of Pennsylvania, which had one of the top nursing research programs in the country. I obtained my PhD there. And afterwards, I was uh, hired to be a faculty member at the University of Miami and then afterwards to Florida International University in Miami, which is part of the Florida State University system. And in the course of my serving as a faculty member, I got recruited after I was tenured to be a department chair, and then I was a department chair there. I was a department chair at the University of Texas Health Science Center at San Antonio, and then I be, was hired back to FIU to be a dean of the School of Nursing. And then I was asked to merge two schools. I merged the School of Nursing with the School of Health Sciences and became the Dean of the College of Nursing and Health Sciences. And after a period of, this was a 10 year period when I was Dean of a school and Dean of a college, a new president came along, President Mark Rosenberg, who was uh, here actually uh, last week for the inauguration, he spoke. And he asked me to uh, start an office of community engagement. So I became the founding vice president for engagement at FIU, created many partnerships with uh, the public school system, with corporations, organizations, started a big life sciences initiative. And it was because of that work that the search firm Greenwood and Associates called me about this position at UMass Dartmouth. So I'm very thrilled to be here. I'm very proud of uh, the history of UMass Dartmouth dating back to 1895. It started as the New Bedford Textile School and the Bradford Durfee Textile School that merged to become Southeastern Massachusetts Technical Institute that then evolved into Southeastern Massachusetts University and then entered the UMass system and became UMass Dartmouth in 1991. So we have been in the UMass system for a little bit over 20 years. So I had my formal inauguration last week and um, I told my story as part of my inaugural ad address and I think that you have access to that through, uh, I, I believe the video is available on our website. Uh, so you can listen to that or look at that if you're uh, so interested. But I wanted to uh, convey a message to everybody. First of all, I want to congratulate you for having reached this part of your educational experience. Um, I would like you to remain focused on your goal. Um, and enlist the support of everybody around you, your family members, your faculty, and also your friends, so that you can arrive at your destination, whatever that may be. Everybody in the room has some goal they have in mind, but that path, I can assure you, is not going to be linear. It is never linear, right? I plan to be a nurse researcher and look where I am. Um, so I thought that uh, my mother was a teacher, and my grandmother was a teacher, my father wanted me to become an attorney, my mother wanted me to be a teacher, and I insisted on becoming a nurse, and I ended up in higher education. <laughs> so, uh, so that path is not linear, but just because it's not linear doesn't mean that you don't make plans. You have to be goal-oriented and keep following along so that eventually you reach your goal. Do not be discouraged when you encounter obstacles. Michael Jordan said, obstacles don't have to stop you, 
If you run into a wall, he says, don't turn around and give up. Figure out how to climb it, go through it, or work around it. Okay, so any barrier, um, no barrier is insurmountable. So try to go through or around obstacles. And I'm sure you have encountered, let's have this conversation, I'm sure you have encountered being stereotyped. How many of you have experienced being stereotyped? Okay. Let me tell you a story. This just happened last month. So I was at a big UMass System alumni event in Naples at the St. Patrick's Day Parade. We had hundreds of alumni there. And I was sitting wearing my UMass Dartmouth t-shirt. And a woman comes over to me and she says, so you work at UMass Dartmouth? I said, yes, I'm the chancellor. She says, oh, you work in student affairs? I said, no, I'm the chancellor of UMass Dartmouth. She says, oh, you're the director of student affairs. <laughs> I mean, just, just hear how many times I had to say it. I said, no, I'm the chancellor of UMass Dartmouth. She said, oh, you're the vice chancellor of <laughs> student affairs. And finally, her husband said, oh, no, 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 she's the chancellor. That means she's the head of the university. So that happened only last month. And last week at my inauguration, um, the tradition is, there are delegates who come from different universities, either the president or the provost or some administra administrator of a university. They come and attend the inauguration of a new president or a new chancellor. So we had about 60 delegates who came to UMass Dartmouth. So the first four or five arrived and they were in this room where we had lunch uh, served for them. And my assistant said, Chancellor, you have to come out now because you've got four or five people that are already here and there's no one there to welcome them. So I came out and I started talking to them and you know, sharing information about the ceremony and what's going to happen. And we were talking for a good 10, 15 minutes and one of them finally said to me, what role do you play here? What, what job do you have here at UMass Dartmouth? And I looked at him and I said, I am the chancellor that's going to be inaugurated this afternoon. So that's just my way of saying that um, don't be discouraged when you en uh, encounter that. Um, do not be deterred by uh, experiencing being stereotyped or even experiencing prejudice or racism because Prejudice or racism is a function of being human. All of us have our biases. I mean, if we're honest about it, every person in this room has biases, right? Um, and part of what we do in learning cultural competence is to try to minimize those biases. And the way we do that is in having forums like this so we understand each other. And I think learning more about each other and the history of why we came here and our stories helps helps, I think, to address some of those biases. Um, I also wanted to say a little bit about, and, and I'm not trying to stereotype, but there are characteristics that are common to many Asian cultures. Um, but let me say before I proceed with the rest of my comments that the degree to which a person adheres to their traditional culture, let me just say that, is modulated by a number of factors. And what are those factors? Give me one. In other words, the degree to which I am traditionally Filipino uh, will be modulated by what factors? In other words, to the degree that I am less or more of some characteristic that is common among Filipinos will be modulated by? By my? My personal preference. Okay, family, what else? Location. There's, there's some really important factors that haven't been mentioned. What are they? Where you live, urban or rural, right? What else? How about age, right? Uh, I think in general, I guess in general, the older you are, probably the more, the more adherent you would be to the traditional culture. In general, but that's not always the case. What else? How about level of education, right? People who have more education probably would be more broad-minded and more open-minded. Um, tell me how accent affects your adherence to traditional culture. Ah, the perception of people of you when you have an accent. Okay, all right, so it's how other people perceive you. Okay, all right, so 
Uh, I just want to say that before I proceed with the rest of my comments because I do not want you to think I'm stereotyping. I'm making these statements because these are common characteristics of many Asian cultures. Uh, but the degree to which they would be true of me or any one of you will be modulated by these factors that I spoke about, right? So, um, as an ethnic group, Asians tend to be modest and self-effacing and not very vocal, not very assertive in general. Obviously, there are many exceptions to that. Sometimes that works against us. We have to adapt, right, to American culture and learn to be more expressive and assertive and to speak up when the occasion or the circumstance calls for such action. If you have not already done so, I advise you to create a network of friends and colleagues who can provide support or advice or just with whom you can hang out with or relax whenever there's a lot of stress or whenever you find that the rigor of the work or the grueling schedule uh, makes things <laughs> such that you need to hang out and relax. In general, Asians tend to engage in high context communication. There's a man who studied this, his name is Edward Hall, and there are many books available that he's written, and one of them is on the notion of high context and low context communication. In general, Asian people tend to communicate in high context. That means there's more of a focus on nonverbal versus verbal. So when you're talking to someone who's of Asian descent, pay very close attention to the facial expression, the tone of the voice, the gestures. In other words, there's a lot of focus on the nonverbal and the message is being sent more with the nonverbal than with the verbal. Just let me give you an example. When you look at the Japanese bowing, right? There's a tremendous amount being communicated with the depth of the bow, right? Uh, so the depth of the bow indicates the level of uh, respect uh, for the person uh, in front of whom the person is bowing. That is all high context. There are no words being expressed, but the bow is conveying a very important message. In general, non-Asian cultures tend to be, or, or Western cultures tend to be low context. So in other words, the message is contained in the words. So where we get a little confused or caught up is when somebody who is primarily high context in the way they communicate is not communicating in words what they want or what they mean and therefore you hear people say well if that's what she meant why didn't she tell me right so what is that person expecting is that low or high context low, low context that person is expecting words if that's what you mean you have to say it in words and on the other hand someone might say I didn't have to tell her she should have known what is that person expecting? Uh, High context. She should have known. How should she have known? She should have known by the tone of my voice. She should have known by the way I turned my back when I said yes. She should have known by the hesitancy with which I said yes. I kind of said yes, but it wasn't an enthusiastic yes. Or in the case of my daughter Claire, when she and my daughter Regina have a fight and I tell her to say sorry, she says, I'm sorry. <laughs> so when you look at the message and you look at the context, right, the expression on her face, she's really not sorry, right? So she's saying the words, but the nonverbal is very powerful. So in general, Asian uh, people tend to communicate more in high context, and that's a big difference. Uh, in fact, that's a source of frustration for American businessmen who travel to Asian countries because they think, they sometimes think that we're passive aggressive because we're not expressing it in words, we're con expressing it in high context. So that's a big difference. Um, it can be quite confusing uh, when Asians communicate with our professors or others in high context when they expect low context and a miscommunication can result inadvertently. So the best advice I can give you is to try to adapt to American culture but do not forget who you are and preserve your own heritage and culture. You can't forget that. There is a common Filipino saying, and there's somebody here from the Philippines, and I'm gonna say it in Tagalog, which is my um, first language. English is my second language. Um, in Tagalog it says, ang hindi lumingon sa pinanggalingan, hindi makakarating sa paroroonan, which means, 
A person who does not look back from whence they came will never reach their destination. So in other words, you cannot forget who you are. It's important to remember to be true to yourself. Do not forget who you are and your roots, but be adaptable in your new environment. So I want to congratulate all of you uh, for your success thus far and wish you more success as you proceed in your trajectory, in your educational trajectory and your career trajectory. Uh, I will stop here and see if you have any questions so we can have a discussion. Thank you. First question. We want a brave person to ask the first question. Do you want to be the first? Do you have a question? Um, as an Asian American, uh, what do you think are some of the biggest obstacles in terms of transitioning from the Philippines to the US in terms of schooling and education? Okay, so this is where the heterogeneity is important to understand because one size doesn't fit all. Uh, again, we have to go back to the history. So the Philippines was colonized by Spain for more than 300 years, and then it was colonized by the United States. So the educational system in the Philippines was established by Americans. So in fact, I remember in first grade, I was reading about A is for apple when we had no apples. <laughs> apples don't grow in the Philippines. But because the books came from the US, I learned A is for apple, Did not, had not seen an apple until I was grown. So, um, so you, you basically uh, look at the history of the particular country. So let me speak about the Philippines uh, as a case in point. So. Um, Immigrating from the Philippines to the United States, even though English was the medium of instruction in the Philippines, so in other words, when you went to school, so you spoke your, uh, the, the national language is Tagalog, which is, which is the, uh, the entire country of 7,100 islands, uh, that's the national language, but each region has a dialect. So in my, uh, my, the city where I grew up, the dialect was Chabacano, which is corrupted Spanish. So I spoke Tagalog, was my first language, but I also spoke this corrupted Spanish called Chabacano because my, my uh, family members all spoke it. Um, so I learned English in school. So when I went to first grade, the medium of instruction was English, and that's where I went and, and learned English. And English was the way you learn, because all the books were in English, everything was in English. Um, However, those teachers didn't necessarily go to school in the US, and so therefore when I came, one of my first difficulties was communicating with people because the English that I learned, I found out, was very old-fashioned English and people don't talk like that. Uh, and the first few months, I had a notebook with me because I would have to write idiomatic expressions. They would say things that I had no clue what they were talking about, even though they were speaking in English. And then there's this other thing called accent, Right? So if you were talking to somebody from the South, they had that Southern drawl. And again, I had no idea what they were talking about, even though they were speaking in English. So there's that. And communication is a big piece, isn't it? I mean, I think, in my opinion, if you master communication, that's one half of it. That's half of the journey. So I think communicating is, is a big piece. Um, I encountered the issue of speaking with my peers. Uh, because I came with a group of nurses to Mount Sinai Medical Center and um, they always insisted on speaking in Tagalog with each other and I found that to be a little uncomfortable for me because if I'm speaking in Tagalog and there's somebody in the room that doesn't understand so I insisted on speaking in English when somebody in the room is English speaking which is most of the time uh, because we were a small group there and most of the people were American. Um, and so I ran into an issue there because um, some of the um, physicians, for example, were concerned that there was this group of nurses and they were speaking in Tagalog, right? And, and then within my peer group, I also had an issue because they thought that because I was speaking in English that all of a sudden I was this hoity-toity person that they thought I was looking down on Tagalog. Um, so. So I dealt with that. And then I think there's this issue of cultural norms, what's considered acceptable and what's considered not acceptable. And I think each person has to navigate that themselves. 
depending on what country they come from and depending on where they grew up. Uh, for example, I grew up in a um, in a small town, but then I went to college in a big city in Manila. So, so I would consider my background more urban than rural, but depending on where you grew up, that also, I think, affects the way that you deal with some of these differences. So I think in general, um, you learn how to adapt, um, but I think it's important as you adapt that you don't forget who you are. So um, let's see, somebody this morning talked about a fruit salad as opposed to um, a, uh, what is it? Melting no, the, not the melting pot, what do you, you know when you uh, mix all the fruits together? Smoothie. Like a smoothie. So a fruit salad as opposed to a smoothie. So what we want to do is be the pieces in the fruit salad. So in other words, we're all in that container together but we're preserving our heritage and preserving our culture. I think it's important to do that. But you can't forget who you are and where you came from. Uh, and you want to preserve that because that's your own identity. So um, I think I'm very American. When people look at me, they think I'm American, but they're surprised when they find out, for example, how old-fashioned I am when it comes to values, how old-fashioned I am when it comes to food, uh, and many things that they're surprised because it's very deceptive when you look at me. And I'm sure it's the case for many people as well. But thank you for the question. Next question. Ooh. <laughs> Should I be scared that there are no questions, Fernando? <laughs> But I, you know, you just answered a question that I was thinking with all the subjects you just touched. But about forgetting that, you know, not forgetting who you are. Never apologize for who you are. Right. You know, be a person, if you're a person of honor, of integrity, you know, of, uh, of being able to uh, to uh, benefit society. You know, right. What value you bring to society. It really makes no difference, you know, what value you speak, what color you are. Or you are right. You know. So that's the thing, you know, it's the, uh, it's the networking, the mixing, you know, because, you know, you can't be shy and isolate yourself from, from those around you. And you, and you mentioned that about, you know, networking and, and all of that. You know, so that's, uh, you know, that's a very important point in order to apologize. Thank you, Fernando. Yes, Marlene. In school, a lot of teachers don't seem to understand that Asian students are taught not to look at an adult figure directly. Yes. That that would be disrespectful. I don't know if you want to talk about that. Yes. But, you know, yes. Definitely educators need more cultural background so that they don't misinterpret that that child is acting out their culture and not being disrespectful. Sure. So there's this thing called eye contact, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and there's also physical space. Uh, so let me speak about eye contact. So in many cultures, um, to express respect for somebody in authority, and a faculty member would be a person in authority, for example, or an older person would be considered a person that you need to respect, um, what you do is you do not look that person straight in the eye. That's considered disrespectful and intrusive. So some Asian cultures uh, follow that, that you don't look a person straight in the eye, you look down, because you're showing respect. Um, and it's not just some Asian cultures, or some Latin American cultures also have the same thing. Um, and the difference, I think, is in the interpretation that the person who's being accorded respect has to understand that that's what that person is doing, because sometimes the interpretation is just the opposite. They think that that person is disrespectful because they're not looking the person straight in the eye. Okay, so, so in mainstream American communication, in order to be seen as somebody who is respectful, somebody who pays attention, somebody who is honest, uh, and I've heard this, I was at a meeting once and somebody said, um, you can't trust that person because they, they're not looking you straight in the eye. Um, and so you have to look at the, so how do, how do we interpret that behavior? You always look at the cultural context, right? and see if there are cultural factors that modulate that behavior. So let me speak about physical space because this is very important physical space. So in many Asian cultures, not all, in many Asian cultures you do not go about and you know giving a hug to strangers. 
right? Uh, so you only reserve that for members of your family or for friends, intimate friends. Um, but I have now spent 30 years in Miami where un beso y un abrazo is standard. And if you don't give the person a hug and a kiss, they think you're very cold and you're not warm. So now I have to disabuse myself of that practice because that's standard in Miami. Uh, but it's not standard in many other parts of the United States, so I have to be careful with that. And when you look at uh, business uh, books, they speak about not doing that because it could be misinterpreted. Uh, and there are some issues associated with that. So, so in some cultures, it's okay that you, know, you hug and kiss when you're happy about something. But in some cultures, you maintain that physical space. I'd like you to watch this. Have you seen this where two people are talking and one person is moving forward into the other person's physical space. I watch the way people interact. And the other person is withdrawing. <laughs> and the other person is totally oblivious. And they keep advancing into the other person's physical space. So pay attention to that. When, when a person withdraws from you, that means they're uncomfortable with the physical space. Right? So, uh, and that's also culturally influenced. Culturally influenced. The, um, the degree of physical space that a person requires to be comfortable in communication. Okay, long answer to a question, yes? Following up on your, your other question, uh, your other point about the, uh, um, my question is in terms of the culture. Um, given the Philippines' um, history with Spanish and then followed by the yes. American uh, Yes. How much is the culture of the Philippines now reflective of what was adopted from the Philippines and the United States over the years? That's a very good question. I'm actually a student of colonization. So I like to read about uh, countries that have been colonized. Like I've, I've read a lot about uh, uh, Dutch colonization of Indonesia. Uh, for example, uh, I've read about uh, French colonization of, uh, of Haiti. Um, so I, I'm, I, I've read about British colonization of India. Uh, and I'm very interested in that because I'm very interested in what happens at the end of that period of colonization. So what remains in the Philippines? I think that culture is very dynamic and this is one thing that we have to always remember. It's as we're talking, that culture is changing. So whatever I described here is changing as we're talking right now. Um, and I also want us to remember this thing called, you probably studied it in your anthropology class. Remember the emic and the etic? Can somebody tell me the difference between the emic and the etic? E-M-I-C and E-T-I-C. What's the difference between those two? Yes. No? Okay, so it's the insider's perspective and the outsider's perspective. So always think when you're looking at something that's cultural that there's your perspective as an outsider and then there's the perspective of the insider. And it's very important, like when you're doing a project in the community, always remember that you're an outsider. You have to understand the perspective of the insider, right? And that you don't do things to the community or do things at the community, you do things with the community. So to answer your question, what has remained of Spanish colonization of the Philippines? I think that there are many, um, many institutions that have been significantly influenced by Spain. Uh, I think that the, um, the very strong um, uh, Christian heritage, Catholic heritage, is influenced by Spain. I mean, they came, uh, Magellan came March 16, 1521 in the Philippines. He arrived in the Philippines March 16, 1521, and the first thing they did was to plant a cross, right, and say mass. So there's a very strong religious tradition, a very strong Catholic religious tradition. Um, Spanish influence is also seen in, you can see it in the, some of the architecture, you can see it in the language. There's still a large Spanish-speaking population in the Philippines. You can see it in the style of dress, you can see it in uh, influence on food. So I think there are many, many influences, very strong influences of Spain. But the difference that 
the U.S. brought is that the U.S. established the public educational system. So it's not to say that the Spaniards didn't establish schools. They established parochial schools, so the schools that were attached to the churches, but many of them were not accessible to the majority of the population. And so, and, and in fact, I hope nobody is going to protest when I say that, and this is what the historians say, is that the Spanish colonizers did not want the native people to learn Spanish because they felt that if they did, it would be used as an instrument of propaganda. Uh, and in fact, the people who were wealthy sent their sons and daughters to Spain uh, so that they learned Spanish and they learned, they were educated in Spanish because the literature, the sciences, everything was in Spanish. So yes, there's still a very strong Spanish influence, but I think the American influence, even though it was a very short time, is very powerful because of the influence of education. And that makes the difference, right? Education is the... Sure. What about the legal system? Uh, which had more effect on the legal system? The Spanish colonization or the uh, American uh, I you know, I'm out of my league here. I should ask my brother, who's an attorney, to come and answer this question. But, um, but I think there's an influence of both. As to which one is more predominant, I really don't know. I know that uh, the Spanish legal system had a, a strong influence, but I think that there's also a strong American influence. Our educational system, um, by the way, was established by the Americans, but it only goes to 10th grade. So. Um, so you go from first grade, so elementary school is from first grade to sixth grade, and then high school is from first year to fourth year, and then you go to college. So like my college education was five years. Um, so my bachelor's degree was for five years. So it's established by the Americans, but somehow something happened to the, uh, the length of the, um, the period of education. Uh, it's a little bit abbreviated. So the college got a little bit longer and the K to 12 got shorter. Yes? Uh, I have seen some, di some difference between Bangladesh and America. In Bangladesh, when I was there, I supposed to call my teachers by saying teacher, Mr. Or, Sir or Ma'am. But here, when I came here, I have to call them by name. Is that same in uh, Filipino? Absolutely. Um, I cannot tell you how long it took me to get used to that, I have just started doing that, I would say maybe when I was a dean, and in fact, even when I was a dean, and that's recent memory, even when I was a dean, I couldn't call certain faculty who are much older than me by their first name. I just couldn't. I had to call them Dr. Porter and Dr. Simonek and Dr. This, because growing up, that was sort of inculcated in you, that to show respect, you can't call a person by their first name. Um, so in general, I think American culture is very open and very friendly, right? So when you sit next to American people, they are so open and so receptive and so friendly. Um, Asian cultures tend to be a little bit more reserved. Um, you can be friendly, but it takes longer, I think, to, to be friendly because there's that natural self-effacement and reserve. Um, so that, that is definitely an issue that um, you learn, it's more, uh, how do I describe it? It's more hierarchical, right? Asian cultures tend to be more hierarchical. So if you're up in the hierarchy by virtue of age or social class or wealth, then people have to call you a certain way or refer to you a certain way in order to accord respect. Whereas American culture is very open and, um, and it's sort of a, a, a culture of peers. So in other words, we're all equal regardless of who we are, our position in life, our wealth or lack thereof, um, that there is that um, feeling that it's equitable and therefore we are, call each other by our first names. Um, but I still have difficulty with that even to this day. Yes, yes. When it comes to um, admittance or, or transfer um, acceptance into UMass Dartmouth, um, because the world is so focused on being politically correct, um, is there a certain percentage of different cultures that you that you want to have um, admitted to the school, or is it strictly based on your um, your academic history? 
are there any type of, or is there any stereotyping in the sense of, okay, well, we have, we want to have a certain percentage of Asian population or different, different cultures, I guess. Okay, so, let, first of all, let me clarify that that, if, if we did that, that's not stereotyping. Stereotyping, it, the definition of stereotyping is, is that when you meet somebody, not knowing anything about them, if they belong to a certain group, you ascribe to them the characteristics of that group. So in the example I gave, uh, the reason why I call that stereotyping is they look at me and one, I'm a woman and I'm Asian, therefore I could not possibly be the chancellor of UMass Dartmouth. So I see that as a double stereotype, right? It's because I'm a woman and I'm Asian, therefore it's not possible for me to be the chancellor of a university. So in the case you spoke about, I think it's very important to have a very diverse student cl um, class that we admit because we want the students to learn from each other. Um, we want people of all levels, all cultures, um, all classes, all walks of life to be in a class because it's just as important for the students to learn from each other as it is for them to learn in the classroom. Um, similarly, because we live in a global world, we want to make sure that the class is international so that we bring the different perspectives to the table. Um, so how we get there uh, depends on, um, in, in the case of UMass Dartmouth, what I know is we have admission standards based on GPA and SATs. Now how we get from there to making sure that we have very diverse makeup, I don't know. But I do know that 25% of our students are students of color. Yes. Hi. Um, my name is Samara Fulmer. I'm an admissions counselor here. Yes. Um, I've lived here for about 15, 16 years in Massachusetts, but um, I am a Filipino. Uh, you are. I'm first generation. Uh, my mother is also from a very small town. Uh, okay. In the um, so I understand a lot of the history of education. She um, was able to finish the sixth grade, um, and at that time in the 60s, that's where public education uh, stopped, but was fortunate to uh, have married my father, who was in the Air Force, um, and finished her education when she came here to the United States. Um, so I'm curious, um, in the short time that you've been in Massachusetts, how have you adjusted, given um, Massachusetts has a relatively small Filipino uh, community in relation to the rest of the Asian American population here? Uh, I love it here for many reasons. Um, some of the reasons I can't share with you right now, but um, <laughs> so should we say that uh, I came from a red state and this is a blue state? <laughs> um, so I like, first of all, I love living in the South Coast. I think it's one of the most beautiful places in the world. And I've traveled to uh, about 70 countries, so I know um, what all those countries look like. I think New England uh, has such bucolic beauty that every day, I live close to a uh, part of the Pascamancet River, and on the other side are the marshes uh, of Buzzards Bay, and it's just spectacular. And I'm a birder, so every day I look out the window, and the other day I looked out the window and there was a northern harrier perched on the branch. Um, my uh, daughters uh, have been coming to camp for eight or nine years when they were kids to New England. Um, so one went to uh, Camp Walden in Denmark, Maine, and the other one went to Camp Vega. So every year for nine years we've been coming to Boston and then visit in Boston and then drive down to Maine to take them to camp. Uh, so we've been visiting all over Massachusetts for many years. My younger daughter went to Wellesley. Um, so one, I love the just the sheer uh, bucolic beauty of the place. Two, I love the emphasis on education. Um, I cannot tell you how, and maybe that's sort of a surprise that shouldn't be a surprise, but I can see every day the results of having a very progressive uh, educational policy. Um, I, I, I can't say the rest of what I have to say without uh, feeling like I'm downgrading people, but I mean, I r receive emails and letters from people that are in complete sentences and entire paragraphs and <laughs> two-page letters that are beautiful, beautifully written. 
I read, and they're not from professors. They're from, you know, people like you and me, and, and they're wonderful. And I look at this and I say, what a history Massachusetts has. Um, and you know, when I go to certain places, so three years ago, I was telling the story in my inauguration speech that three years ago, my family and I were in Concord, about 70 miles from here. And when I was a child, I read Louisa May Alcott's uh, Little Women. I read that three times. I loved it so much. I read it three times. And when I went to visit Louisa May, how many of you have been in Concord? If you haven't, please go there. It's wonderful. You see Louisa May Alcott's house. You go upstairs and you see the desk where she wrote Little Women. And my husband looked at me and said, that's just a piece of wood. I said, it's the desk where she wrote Little Women. It's wonderful. So um, there's Louisa May Alcott's house. There's Nathaniel Hawthorne's house. We walked on Walden Pond and saw the, well the cabin is not there anymore, but you see the area of the cabin where Henry, where uh, Thoreau lived. Um, and, and if you've read Thoreau, it's wonderful to see the place where he wrote all these things. It's just beautiful. There's a lot of uh, intellectual giants in Massachusetts, you know, both literary luminaries, states people like the Kennedys and John Adams and I mean all of the people that created the Commonwealth of Massachusetts there's so much history it's one of the most historic places in the United States there almost there is almost no place that you go to in Massachusetts that is not steeped in history there's always a history associated with it so long and short of it is I love it here so I think even if I did not become Chancellor of UMass Dartmouth I would still be coming to Massachusetts just because of what the place represents and what the place is. Do you love Massachusetts? Yes. You can see why, right? So people ask me, well don't you miss the weather in Florida? Well, actually I miss the weather in Florida, but we have that weather in the summer. The changing landscape of the seasons is spectacular. I mean, I woke up in November and I looked out the window and there was this blazing red maple in front of my window. And in fact, I sent a message to the campus and I said, it reminded me of a poem by Jane Hirschfield called Lake and Maple. Because right there in front of me was this blazing red maple. And as the seasons change, the landscape changes, right? So we're very lucky to be here. The quality of life is very high. So we want you to stay in the South Coast so that all of your talent remains here and you help us develop the place. I just wanted to thank the Chancellor and respect of time. Uh, um, go to, uh, we have a few gifts for the Chancellor. Okay. Well, this is a gift. On behalf of Bristol Community College, uh, I would like to thank you, Chancellor Grossman, for what you have done, what you are doing, and what you will do for the sake of the South Coast. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. be a great role model for all women and women of color. So thank you thank so you. much. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody.